everyone. How are you all doing? Uh, it is an absolutely stunning morning down here by the river. Unfortunately, the fact that the uh, sun has come up quite so perfectly and the sky is quite so blue means that I cannot see my computer screen at all. So it's going to be quite difficult for me to respond to whatever you're saying to me. But I will do my level best, as always. Uh, right, OK, I've already started getting some questions in from all over the world, which is really good news. Uh, hello to Matthew, age 11. Riley Wallace, age 10, from Basingstoke, says hi. Hello, you all. Uh, Sarah Beckingham, what a lovely sunny day. And it's my birthday. I know, I've got written down to wish you happy birthday, Sarah. It's all right, calm down. I was going to get to it. A very happy birthday to you. Um, and to hello to Joe and Ben as well. So before we get going, while I'm waiting for the last few people to, uh, to you know, wipe themselves down their sweat after finishing Joe Wicks. Uh, let me tell you a few things that we've got coming up. Um, so next week, super, super exciting. Um, I have uh, got hold of some rather unusual footage. Um, some of you may know that I was uh, voted as the Explorer of the Year by the Scientific Exploration Society. Uh, thank you very, very much for getting in touch to, to say well done, by the way. But that's not what I actually wanted to talk about. One of the other award winners is an incredibly talented young man called Toby Nolan. And Toby set off a couple of years ago to try and uh, achieve the impossible, so I thought, to try and film the rarest large land mammal on the planet, an animal that I thought was as good as extinct. He has already achieved incredible things and got some amazing footage, and he has given me the great privilege of premiering some of that footage this time next week. So, 0930 next week, do not miss it. You're going to see something that nobody has ever seen before. And because of that, I'm going to make the theme for next week endangered. So we'll try and keep it light, but we will be talking about endangered and extinct animals uh, and all of the repercussions uh, of extinction and uh, the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. Um, I have, as some of you will know, set up a YouTube channel. I'm uploading loads and loads of my, my uh, videos. So that's some of them are, are 20 years old from when I first started out in television. Uh, there's one of me diving into a pool in the Sinai Desert, which turned out to be about that deep. And the repercussions were not pleasant. But there's lots of that sort of stuff on there. So uh, head along to my YouTube channel, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and it'll tell you when there is something new coming up. Um, okay, it's a massive shout out to Doant Side School, who wants to know what the first place I'm going to go to after the lockdown is. Chips, either chips or curry, one of the two. Uh, Pitt Lockery High School, hello to all of you, and a massive hello to, uh, to Lola and to Finn as well. Um, Ollie, Liam, Jamie and Jenna in Bristol want to know how to attract birds into their garden. And Kiki and Ezekiel, Fawcett Howitt from Lincoln, uh, say that they are getting starlings, blackbirds and wood pigeons, but want to try and attract great tit, chaffinch, robin, thrush, etc., which they can hear but not see. OK, so uh, a whole variety of different things there. For the finches, you want to uh, usually go for, for niger seed, which comes in the, the, uh, the slit-shaped hole uh, feeders. So the, the black seeds are really, really good for goldfinches, greenfinches, and have actually been a big part of the reason why those birds are making such a comeback. It's quite difficult to get thrushes uh, onto feeders because they, they feed down on the ground, but mealworms on the ground, and sometimes they will feed underneath the feeders as well. I have, though, one suggestion for you. Fat balls. So you can make your own fat balls. Essentially what it is, is suet or lard. And when it's, uh, when it's been melted down and it's liquid, put in some peanuts, maybe some grated cheese, uh, some other seeds. And then if you put it in the fridge overnight, it will solidify. You can put that inside a yogurt pot or something else and then peel that off afterwards. Or maybe put it into a, a half coconut shell and then hang it up. And those are genius for attracting uh, all sorts of birds. Um, I mean, they're even better in the autumn and the winter when those birds really need uh, a lot of extra food. But right now as well, they are super, super good. We have um, a question here from the other side of the world. Why are Australian birds like crows and magpies different to, in size to UK ones? Our crows are massive and magpies small. Yours are the opposite. Well, that's not entirely true. So we have some really big crows in this country too. Our raven is a, a, a giant bird, but you're, you're definitely right about magpies. And there's a really good reason for that. So the British magpie, the, the black and white bird, magpie, pie meaning black and white, uh, is a crow. It's in the corvid family. 
The Australian crow, the Australian magpie, is not. It's not a corvid. It's not in the crow family. It's uh, actually a passerine or perching bird. And it has a call that goes like this. Hopefully I can play this to you. That sound just transports me back to Australia, one of my favourite places in the entire world. And that's the call of the Australian magpie. Uh, they're incredibly vocal, certainly when they start singing very early in the morning and you're trying to get to sleep, that is not the most welcome sound ever. But it kind of signifies why the two birds are so different. The Australian magpie is a passerine. The British magpie is a corvid or crow. Um, my three lovely boys, Gabriel, Laurie and Finn Carroll, uh, say that you're their absolute hero. Well, thank you very much. I hope that's not just a way of getting me to read out the next thing. If so, it's worked. They recently raised £725 for the WWF by doing a sponsored readathon thon at home. They read 114 books between them. Oh, that's brilliant. Well done, you all. That's really, really amazing. Uh, Cassandra Jane says my sons, uh, Joe, and their stepdaughter are raising money for the Woodlands Trust um, as part of the 2.6 challenge. They did 26 exercises each and are raising £26 each. Well done, you all. Um, we have a happy 8th birthday to Elise, happy 9th to Al Alfie Hamill from North Ireland, a 10th for Ella, uh, Ishbel, is that Ishbel or Isabel? A very happy 9th birthday, Harry B turned 8, and Nate, uh, happy 9th. And then Sarah Beckingham, look, I've got it down here. I was going to say happy birthday to you and everything. Uh, Zachary from Kings Lynn would like to know what the best food to leave out for hedgehogs uh, and deer that are now coming to our garden is. Uh, uh, well, I, I wouldn't leave out extra food for the deer to be honest you will probably soon be absolutely sick of them and want rid of them hedgehogs on the other hand uh, so the the advice currently for hedgehogs is cat food that's that's the best thing to leave leave out for them uh, whatever you do don't leave out uh, milk and bread because it upsets their little tummies uh, charlotte from pin oh, i love this question why do spiders not stick to their own webs that is a great question um okay so um, i don't know if you can see any of this spider web behind me here probably not in this light but there's lots of different kinds of spider silk and not all of it is sticky so these incredibly strong wires there probably just looks like i'm plucking air but that is actually part of the spider's web um those are a different kind of silk altogether and it doesn't have any stickiness to it the 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 big circular thread which is put in last that's the one that's all all sticky and so spiders will essentially pick their way very carefully around their web uh, stepping on the non-sticky bits it's one of the strongest materials in nature one of the strongest uh, and most stretchy materials in nature but not necessarily sticky so they they choose their way uh, to move around the web if i could say to any young naturalist out there one thing that you could do just once in your life, put this on your list of a hundred things to do in your lifetime. Watch a spider make a web. It's a very simple thing. It, it takes about an hour, but watching a common garden or web weaving spider make its web is one of the miracles in nature. Watch it once, you will never ever forget it. Uh, let me quickly show you what's going on with our swans here. So any of you who've been following these, these lessons will know that um, for the last few years, Helen and I have had swans nesting in our back garden. Uh, we have been feeding them five or six times a day, hoping that they will come and nest here this year. And guess what? They started nesting in my neighbor's garden. Uh, so obviously we're not, we're not speaking to them anymore, but this is the, uh, this is the nest as it is at present. Um, she is now sitting on that nest. So uh, although she's been out feeding and foraging um, for the last few weeks, and there we have uh, nine eggs she's on, nine eggs. She has been a very busy girl. But now that uh, all of the eggs are laid, she will now uh, sit on them and she won't move from that nest very much. Uh, she'll stay there taking care of them and uh, brooding those eggs. And I will bring you, nothing much is gonna happen for the next couple of weeks, but when they do start to hatch out, I'm pretty confident that the cygnets will be coming back up onto our lawn. They always have done in the past and I will uh, bring you lots and lots of footage of them. Um, so Jay Macbeth wants to know what is the most interesting animal you've seen from your house windows well this is my house window so I've seen some pretty cool stuff we've seen badgers otters dolphins red squirrel red deers barn owls and a sparrow hawk because we're in the Isle of Arran all right Jane no one likes a show off seriously well I've seen red kites that's pretty cool I also saw a cormorant trying to swallow an eel whole, uh, which was 
pretty astounding. I, I even got some footage of it. I'll maybe show, you, show that to you uh, next week. Sophia and Sammy, both eight from Devon, have seen buzzards fighting in the air with crows, and they'd like to know why this is. Okay, so this is a, a very well-known behaviour. It's called mobbing. And what happens, particularly this time of year, when, uh, when birds are nesting, is they will, um, they will try and drive off predators. Any predator that comes into their world, they see it as a threat, and they try and, and drive it away. And, you know, I have seen passerines, small perching birds, driving away golden eagles. You know, the biggest birds of prey that we have here in this country. It's, it's a phenomenal sight. So, yeah, uh, there will be lots and lots of mobbing going on this time of year. That's what's happening. Um, and it's, it's incredibly brave, really. You know, they are, they are risking their own lives in order to, to drive away a predator. But, uh, you know, obviously their, their nests, they're putting, investing a lot of energy into their nests. And we will we'll be talking a, a fair bit about that in this chat. So I'm just restarting my messages here because they're, uh, they're not working properly. So uh, I've got 10 minutes into this conversation without saying that our theme is backyards. This is all about urban wildlife. So let's see if we can get to some questions about urban wildlife. Uh, Joshua, who is six in in Leeds, oh, incidentally, Taylor, aged 10. Swans do not have teeth, no, although they do have a little ridge to their beak, which means that when they bite, it quite hurts. Um, and, uh, yeah, sorry, Joshua, who's aged six in Leeds, would like to ask how he can attract birds into a new bird box in his garden. Uh, and my animal bum on Insta, I wonder if that's their real name, uh, asks the same thing. Listen, once you've got a bird box up, best thing to do is just to leave it in place. It's all about sighting. You know, getting a bird box in the right location to begin with is the important thing. Once it's up, there's not a huge amount uh, that, that you can do about it. You don't want to move it and potentially scare off something that might already be investigating that nest. Uh, lots of information online about the best way and place to put up your bird box, but that's the key, making sure that you sight it well to begin with. Um, Simon Millet has slow worms and grass snakes. Good for you, but the cats kill them. How can you keep them away? Have you tried lion poo? I'm not making it up. That is actually a thing. A diesel punk girl. Her cat is bringing it. Oh dear, we're all on the uh, on the cat track now. Her cat is bringing in rabbit kits. Should we return them to the Warren? So uh, that's a tricky one. Highly, highly unlikely that a, uh, a, a, a rabbit mother would take back its kits, but I guess it's as good a thing to do to do with them as anything. Um, Hannah Louise Holwell, uh, I'm not a kid, but as a young adult, I've been following you for years. I did my dissertation on the urban hedgehog and how most admissions into rehab centres are due to urban effects. That is, uh, new building developments as houses uh, causing habitat fragmentation. Should there be stricter government policies in regards to number of houses on an estate to the amount of green space? Amazing question. Simple answer is yes, there is al al already um, habitat uh, legislation that, that makes sure that, you know, for example, if you are building near to a, a site of special scientific interest, uh, there will be a limited amount of houses. And as much as anything, it, it is because people bring with them cats and dogs that will go into those uh, wild places and cause an enormous amount of wild animal mortality. In terms of what we could do in our, um, in our houses, try and avoid that habitat fragmentation, fra fra fragmentation. You know, provide a way that hedgehogs and other animals can move backwards and forwards uh, between lots of different gardens. So speak to your neighbours and ask if it's okay for you to put just a little hole in your, your fences that will allow hedgehogs to roam over a much larger area uh, and all of a sudden you join up lots of small fragmented habitats for them. Great question. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, Harry and Eli Wills in Suffolk would like to know which British bird has the best eyesight and how much better is it than ours? Okay, so um, most birds of prey are said to have eyesight that is at least five to eight times better than our own, but that is not telling the full story at all. A golden eagle can see a rabbit that is two miles away that is, is just very slightly twitching. It's likely that they have much better perception of movement than we do. They have the ability to see polarized light far better than we do. So that figure of five to eight times, it really doesn't tell the whole story. In terms of which has the best, um, kestrels have the ability to perceive um, UV light. They are, they are able to, to see voles that are long gone by the trails, the urine trails that they have left behind them, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, I've got a couple of questions in asking why I'm wearing this shirt. 
uh, Team GB from Rio 2016. Uh, obviously, I'm not an Olympian myself. Uh, this was given to me by a, a truly amazing gentleman, Mr. Pete Reed, three times gold medal winner, one of the uh, the great champions this nation has ever had. Um, Pete has has suffered uh, with some some health problems recently, and he is he is learning to rewalk again. So I wore this shirt today to to say. Pete, we are thinking of you, and you are, in our eyes, an enormous hero. And, uh, yeah, a massive, massive shout-out to you. Um, so, Cole, who's seven, asks, when will birds start using my nest boxes? Evelyn and uh, Matthew from Chorley says, we have blue tits using our nest box. When might we see babies? I guess that kind of answers the previous question. Uh, and Joseph, who's five, from South Yorks, says he has great tits taking nesting material from tennis ball fuzz. Is this normal? Well, they will take pretty much anything. Actually, let me show you a, uh, a nest that I've got here. Um, this, unfortunately, had fallen down um, in the backyard, and it is absolutely exquisite. So this is probably Dunnock, could be Robin, and you can see around the outside is, is moss. Now that it's really dried out, it's it's quite fragile. But to begin with, it was really strong. And then the inside, look at that. It's lined with all these downy feathers so that it's lovely and warm for the youngsters. Isn't that beautiful? And, you know, right, right now is absolute prime nesting time for almost all of our garden birds. So um, have faith, have patience. Uh, when it comes to nesting boxes, if you build them, they will come. Uh, what else have we got? From Jack, how long do spiders live? Varies enormously. Uh, some of the, the garden spiders might live for a year. Uh, some of the big therophosids, um, the, uh, the, the tarantulas, might year, live for over 20 years. Uh, I have a friend who had a, um, a pink toad, I think it was, uh, which was 24 years old, which is pretty significant for a, for a spider, or for any invertebrate, really. Oh, OK, so uh, here's a good one. Last week, uh, I asked you if you would help me with naming our badgers. And it was so cool. We had so, so many people writing in with their, their potential names for our new badger cubs that we've been watching since the start of these uh, live Q&As. I think one of my favourites has to be from Dave Cornthwaite, who said that uh, we should name our badgers Game and Match because they already have a set. Boom, 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 shh. I love that. But uh, I'm actually going to go with Alfie, who's eight, from uh, Ludgersall, who suggested that we should call them Wind and Willow, as he was very impressed that the book of that name was written just up the river up there. So, yes, our two young badgers are going to be called Wind and Willow. Alfie, thank you so, so much. So let's catch up, shall we, with uh, our badgers. I've had the cameras out there on their sets now for, uh, for about two months. To begin with, I... I didn't see any youngsters. That's quite normal. You know, they tend to be shy uh, in the early part of the year. Here's a, a very bedraggled looking adult. As you know, we've had quite a lot of uh, rain this week. And uh, yeah, they're still going out and foraging, even when they're soaking wet. But what I really want to talk about is how driven our badgers very evidently are by their sense of smell. So you'll often see badgers, that they've got their nose down to the ground, that can be looking for food. It can also be looking for scent from other badgers. And you can see here the adult animal sniffing the backside of the cub. The reason for that is, is that they have uh, anal glands uh, right by their, their bottom, which secrete a, a really strong smell. Not strong to us, but definitely strong to badgers. And so uh, all around the, the set, they will be marking using those, those anal glands. And you can see the smells clearly drive the others absolutely bonkers. Quite often the, uh, the youngsters will be nose to bottom with each other, playing king of the castle, playing leapfrog, tumbling all over each other, uh, engaging in all this wonderful play, which is so, so much fun to watch, particularly around the mouth of the set where I'm, I'm guessing that they feel quite secure that they feel that uh, you know if any other animal or human did turn up they could just dart back down into the darkness and it's so much fun to watch i have hours and hours and hours of footage of my badgers doing just my badgers i just call them my badgers our badgers uh doing just this playing around I'm particularly fascinated by, by that tree. I'm guessing that there has been a lot of scent marking going on at the base of that tree. So they're sticking their noses into it. They're rubbing their butts on it uh, and occasionally even getting tangled up 
in that wire there, which even though it is you know right at the, the mouth of their set, they're, they're clearly not 100% uh, about keeping clear of. So badgers are in a group called the mustelids. It is uh, also known as the, the weasel family. So they're in a group with things like weasels and stoats and polecats and ferrets and otters and mink. Um, and uh, But sometimes I think that their behavior looks decidedly dog-like. I think that the way that they, they, they snuffle, the way that they play, they just kind of look like big black and white puppies. And there you can see our badger with its snout right down at that tree, uh, which has clearly become the bush telegraph for our badgers and uh, yeah these little black and white shapes um, mm -hmm. just absolutely wonderful to watch uh, I can't quite see if this is but hopefully what you're watching right now is two badgers going bottom to bottom uh, this is uh, kind of bum kissing or bum pressing and this is something which is really really common amongst badgers it, it is a way that they will have their two sets of anal glands coming against each other and it's like they're exchanging their scents exchanging their smells uh, and it's probable they just want to make sure that all of the animals that are in their group have the same scent have the same smell uh, uh, it is however an utterly hilarious thing to do potentially i suppose this could be uh, one of our new greetings now that during lockdown we're not allowed to shake hands or hug anymore uh, forget i said that uh, let's uh, let's move on. What else have we got? I've got lots and lots of questions about badgers. I'll try and get to some more of those uh, next week. Let's see if I've got anything else coming in on the live. Whoa, there's loads and loads of questions. Toby, age 11, wants to know how many species of bugs there are. Um, if you're talking hemiptera, true bugs, uh, several tens of thousands. If you're talking all of the bugs, all of the arthropods, uh, we are into the millions. Uh, Alex, who's 20, any advice for getting into television, doing something scientific? Um, you can't go far wrong with, with going down the line of academia. So uh, getting a biology degree, uh, a master's, potentially a, a doctorate, you know, is a great way to go. And then, you know, get started on something like this. Get your own YouTube channel, uh, start making videos, start making films. Um, and yeah, get out there, learn the language of television and start, start doing it yourself. You're about to hear going past the, uh, the Marlow donkey, a rather wonderful train that comes past uh, just a couple of times an hour on the other side of the river. And uh, I'm going to be drowned out for a second. But it, while, while that's happening, a shout out to Joel in, uh, in Reading. Um, shout out to Finn, who wants to know if there are snakes around High Wycombe. Uh, Finn, yes, we have, we have grass snakes. We have, we have adders. Uh, we don't have any smooth snakes here, or certainly not none that I have seen. Um, Faye in Rockley says there are two red kites in Bletchley that might be mating. Very, very possible. Yes, they are certainly going for it. Uh, right now happy seventh birthday to Panna Lee what a wonderful name happy birthday Panna Lee um, what else have we got lots and lots of people asking about blue tits nesting and Robert's, Robin's nesting um, what does a pigeon sound like Isaac age 10 um, I haven't prepared for this but um, a, a wood pigeon is kind of woo -hoo 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 -hoo. Ooh, 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 ooh. Whereas a turtle dove, which is really, really rare now, probably one that we could be talking about next week in our endangered or uh, extinction segment, is much more of a. Uh, Rowan asking what animal lives the longest. Uh, there are certain kinds of clams, like uh, the, the quay hog, which lives to be over 500, the Greenland shark, at least 400 years of age. Um, Da, da, da. Cameron and Alistair say that we've had hail and thunder and lightning and they would like to know how birds react to these, these conditions. Do they keep flying or do they find a safe place to land? Uh, and uh, they have said that they're loving reading Tiger Wars. Well, thank you very much, you all. Uh, anyone who doesn't know, I have got a series of kids' fiction books out, The Falcon Chronicles. There's four of them uh, and Tiger Wars is the first one. But back to your original question. So um, most birds that are not massively strong flyers uh, in anything but the very lightest of rains will hunker down somewhere and uh, and stay out of the rain. Bats even more so. Uh, and one of the most amazing uh, experiences I've ever had with bats was being in Uganda on a filming experience, sat next to a massive roost of bats. And we were sat out at night having a drink and all these bats started flooding out to feed. There were thousands and thousands of them all flying out in this big swarm. Um, and then as we were sat, sat there sipping our drinks, clear skies, the bats all turned around and flew straight back in again. 
And we were kind of looking at each other going, going, what on earth was, what happened there? No more than 10 minutes later, the skies clouded over and a biblical thunderstorm started. We had no idea that it was coming, but the bats knew. And how? I have absolutely no idea, but clearly they could perceive some kind of change in the atmospheric pressure. And that was enough for every single one of them to turn tail and head back into the roost. It was extraordinary. Um, this is a good one. Abby, who's seven from Hertfordshire. If I was to flap my arms uh, an awful lot, I wouldn't take off, but birds do. How and why? And Harrison, uh, born, who is nine, asks, what are birds' feathers made from? Well, uh, so it, it stands to an awful lot of uh, elements to a bird's anatomy. One particular element is their bones. I haven't got a small bird bone. I have got the very biggest of bird bones, an ostrich bone. Uh, so that is uh, an ostrich bone there. It's huge, but super, super light, much, much lighter than it would be for, for a, a, an equivalent sized mammal. And the reason for that is if you look inside, instead of having great loads of, of marrow and being really, really solid, can you see those, those structures there? Those really thin struts and that honeycomb there, that's what gives the bone its strength. But otherwise, it's not filled with dense marrow. It's just filled with air. So comparatively, they are super, super lightweight. And birds are much lighter than equivalent sized mammals. There are loads and loads of other an anatomical uh, adaptations. I could get to spend hours talking about them, but that's one of the most important. And feathers. Uh, let me bring in a feather prop at this point. There's a nice um, feathers pheasant feather. Uh, these are made of um, keratin, which is a, a super, super common protein. Uh, it's found in our fingernails and in our hair, but there is obviously subtly different composition. And the way that they string together, they can almost zip together like a zip or like Velcro. And when they form one continuous surface, these, these aren't actually flight feathers, but when they form one continuous surface, they can give the animal a huge amount of lift, again, for very little weight which is all really important uh have i seen a fox and a cat fight from max remington yes i have it's um, it is quite something seriously they really go at it large uh someone's saying that they had two arctic turns going for their dog happens quite a lot you know uh, uh, turns well a lot of ground nesting birds can be super super territorial uh, of uh, terrestrial predators and can uh, come in and give them a really hard time you might have heard some common turns behind me actually as i've been talking here this morning it's one of uh, one of the sounds of the river at this time of the year is the is the common turns so I've got loads and loads of questions uh, come in about bees let me quickly though there's some things that i wanted to show you because uh, like i said i've had these camera traps out for ages now and I've been getting some amazing images of deer, uh, two different kinds of deer. So the, the first that I've been seeing more than any other is the muntjac. So this is just up the hill from where I am right now in the, in the, uh, the little woodlands. This is a male muntjac. It is an introduced species. So they escaped from uh, Woburn Park, we believe, in the early 20th century. And they're kind of not much bigger than a dog. So they're, uh, they're about half a metre high at most. The, uh, the males or bucks have uh, have little antlers. The the females don't. That's a that's a female there. Weirdly, walking past our badger set with its tongue hanging out could be that it's it's got some kind of illness or injury. Um, and they're mostly solitary. They don't have a defined rut like many other deer species do. But look at this. We've got two munchaks wandering through the woods. Uh, near our house at night, one of them with the tail arrays. This is probably quite similar to the badgers. This is uh, one uh, deer there, which is just smelling the secretions from the back end of the other. And this is probably something to do with uh, with mating. Can you, can you like, do you guys want to come in? Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to bring in Hells and the uh, and the wee ones because uh, Logan wants to show me his badger socks. While he's doing that, say hello, Hells. Hello. This, these are the little ones. So we've got. Who's out there? Kit. That's Kit. And that's Willow. And uh, Logan is coming in to join us as well. But while we do that, let, let me quickly show you uh, the other deer that we've got around here, which are uh, the roe deer. So these, this is a, a couple of roe deer, a male and a female, wandering through the Bluebell Wood near our house, strolling along, just enjoying the day. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, coming sprinting back through the shot. Oh, we seem to have slowed down a little bit. 
uh, unfortunately. Oh no! This was one of my favourite videos. Oh no, there they go. Sprinting back through shot. And who do you think might have been the culprit? Why were our, our roe deer taking uh, to their feet with so much speed? Well, it was down to this little lady, one of our neighbourhood dogs who clearly smelt them and thought it would be good fun to have a little bit of a chase. Um, so our roe deer at the moment are pretty much always next to each other. There's just, just, just two here. This is, the, uh, this is the male. You see it has antlers and it's always following the female around. And that's probably because uh, we are coming up to breeding time for them. So it sounds like both the muntjacs and the roe deer are, are going to be breeding around here pretty soon, which is just awesome news. Um, so I will keep an eye on them for you all. I will do my best to let you know uh, how things are going on in the world of our deer. Uh, <laughs> but, but talking of, uh, of youngsters and new arrivals on the scene, um, uh, as you can see, I've I've been joined by the whole family. Have we got any, uh, we any birthdays, some birthdays or anything? We came with birthdays for you. I think you've read some of them, though. Okay, so these these are all birthdays, are they? So we have uh, Isabel, Oscar, Oliver, uh, Dominica's mum, Ella, Lewis, Panelly, Joshua, Dexter, and Abby. A massive happy birthday to all of you, uh, Logan. Do you want to say happy birthday to all those people? Happy birthday. <laughs> no, he just wants to to play with my feathers. Uh, <laughs> right, you all, thank you all so, so much for uh, for tuning in. Don't forget to head to my YouTube channel if you're on Facebook right now uh, and subscribe because I'm, I'm putting up new stuff all the time up there, lots and lots of animal stuff, lots of things from my wow. early expeditions as well. Um, next week is going to be all about endangered animals. So remember, I'm going to be premiering that remarkable footage uh, which has never been seen before of an animal that I personally believe uh, was near enough uh, extinct. So that alone is a reason to tune in uh, next week. Uh, so send in any questions that you might have about uh, endangered animals and I will do my very best to answer them. And uh, you're going to help, aren't you? You're going to help? You're going to tickle. Or maybe he's just going to tickle. Tickle, tickle, yes. And on that note, I'd just like to say it's Stevie B and Logan signing out.